time with little or no significance in the overall scheme of things. Clear blue, cold sky all around a breezeless day. FM 96 in the background. Sounds carry from a stereo donated to the cause of low income enters my ears. Cat is listless and can't sit still. He goes from cushion to table to rug in ten second intervals intended to bewilder only the simple minded. There are no ghosts here. Well, there are a few ghosts. Present and past loves, children, not yet children, and parents. Some friends. And in the mirror, FM 96. Janie's got a gun. Run away from the pain. Dog days just begun. The sun warms the sky and decreases the white on the windowsill, heats the cat up so that he has to move again, transcend time and space. He thinks of food. I haven't moved from this metal chair in front of the computer screen, arms of flesh on arms of steel, the outline of my torso firmly meshed with the leather-lined contour. My eyes follow the movement of paws and whiskers. Sunshine creeps across my middle-aged skin. Leafless dreamcatcher tree outside my window wipes away its frost, shines glossy brown on a robin's egg sky, remembers. FM 96, I close my eyes. Crossing my legs, I stretch my toes. The phone light flashes from its location on the black desk. Arm reaches out to the receiver and finds its way to my ear. The day has come for the restitution of our forgotten past. Time to cleanse all the hurt and anger, retell stories forgotten in the land of ash. Turn the soil over with the plow and sow the seeds in the rows of our history. These are not peaceful times upon which one can calmly count on events to shape us without fear. You've become more silent now inside. Let the sun beat down on your face. Make it push back the corners of the very shadowed room. We have a history, you and me. It goes back into the past of our footsteps. Hello? Hello? Who, who is this? I had a dream. In the dream, I was in a room. The room was yellow brick. There was a table covered in maize, and in the middle of the table was a naked child. I got down on my knees to pray, and you were there. You gathered all the kernels in a basket, and the child smiled at both of us. He held a broken arrow in his hand. The edge of the arrow cut me on the wrist, and when you reached for me, it cut you on the wrist as well. Our blood ran together into a small bowl, and the bleeding stopped. The dream stopped. The sound of one cat sleeping. Are you there? I, I, I'm here, I said in the air between my lips and the telephone. The sun warmed down on me through the window and the phone was still there, wedged between my ear and my shoulder. On this hot summer day, I walked down the narrow dusty road leading from the farm to the center of town. William has his hands in his pockets, shirt tail hanging out. There's a sense of purpose in my walk. I stare forward. Today I'm walking with my older brother on our way into town. We don't go in town that often because of the work we have to do on the farm. Mostly cotton and a few chickens. He has his good coveralls on and his Sunday go to meet and shoes. I just stride behind, siding with my hands in my pockets, hot from the sun and a little bit thirsty. I have been troubled lately by fears of something I can't explain. William doesn't seem to be troubled by anything, but he's four years younger and hasn't experienced life that much. I am troubled within my heart. As we walk down the road, I kick a small stone out of my path near the curve that crosses the railroad tracks, where the steam train comes by on Tuesdays. 
There they go again, Paul, off into town. I lean back in my wicker chair, pick up a bit of snuff like my mother used to do before breakfast when she'd take out a corn cob pipe for a smoke. Blind she is now. William and his older brother Cecil shuffling off down the old dusty dirt road, and don't that boy ever tuck in that shirt of his? His bag of trousers scuffling up against his bare heels. Lord almighty, his feet must be as hard as rock. He ain't worn shoes all his life. Paul, there's something I've been meaning to tell you. Been keeping my eye on a large bird hanging on the air overhead when my brother kicks a stone into the creek as we pass the log bridge that old Prosser Carr had built. Fly on my shoulder makes me turn my head and look back. I see Ma and Pa sitting on the front porch in the shade in the corn husk chairs that Ma made last winter when we lost the big field to the flood. I like to walk into town with my big brother. Usually on a hot day we go for a soda or a swim in the creek. He walks faster than me. I speed up. I heard free land is being given away upstate in Clay County, and I gotta get a place of my own away from cotton. Corn and chickens of the future. Why can't my little brother keep up with me? It ain't his bare feet, they're as hard as rock. He most likely wants to stop for a swim. The sweat on my face is cooled down by my straw hat. As I walk, I reach over and grab a hunk of grass from the side of the road and stick it in my mouth. Chew on the end like I always do. Town line coming up. Town line's coming up and he's still chawing on that piece of grass like an old milk cow. That big bird's still flying up above and he ain't told me where he, we're going. Yeah, he seems different today. Can't place it. But then he's almost 19. They must be at the town line by now, Ma. They've been hoofing it for now on half an hour by my watch. I slip it back in my coveralls. It's a good day for a rest on the old front porch. Still in love with my second wife sitting here beside me. Cotton's about half picks, and the niggers that help out from Millerville are at a funeral, and Cecil wanted to go into town with his little brother. I reach over and pat the hound dog on the rump and scratch his old yellow head. What was you wanting to talk to me about, Ma? I look over at her and she has her eyes closed in the sun. Just like when I came to help her daddy in 1891, topping the cotton and fell in love. And then fell in love with her three-year-old son. We got married and we had a son of our own. It's a big farm and I'm usually up early fixing this and doing that and all the while Serena's up there looking after the house and the boys and doing her cooking. I pull my little brother off the dirt road and onto the sidewalk as we make our way into town to the registry office. I've been to school, not like Ma or Pa. And while he's a good farmer, he's old-fashioned and cotton's on the way out. Chickens are on the way in. I read the paper when I came here last, and that's where I saw an article by Guy and Miller about registering for land before August 31st, 1907. Next month, that is. Right up off the road and right onto the sidewalk. He practically picked me right up in the air and then he put his arm around my shoulder and he smiled at me. He doesn't do that much. Usually he just pushes me around. Trees are shady and it's cool where we walk past the house of my cousin Lecta, past the soda shop, and we don't stop. We walked right to the center of the town square and up the steps of the courthouse. High above the town, the long pitch scree of an eagle as it comes into view. I said it was just a bird, but Cecil said it was an eagle. Clear blue sky all around a breezeless day. Eagle dips in front of the sun, coming closer into town. Huge wings, and the door is shut on my view. Heart beats faster as I drag William up the steps to the courthouse to find the registry office. And he's standing and looking out over the city. His body relaxes and he lifts himself up on his heels, searching for something. I close the door behind us and we walk down the long, dark hall. William's not interested in this place, so I send him over to his cousin's house. They're the same age, so they can go for a soda. I walk up to the registry office. I gotta tell Paul, when he came by the farm to help my daddy and we fell in love and married down the road in Lister Church, and I had a son for my first husband, 
and I love him dearly. I gotta tell him I love him still. And I had been thinking that both he and Cecil should know that he was dropped off one morning to, for me to care for, and so I adopted him. He wasn't my dead husband's son, but Pa's asleep in his chair, and the boys are still gone, and it's still hot, and I'm tired. I was up in the hall with my sister Lita, looking out the window when I saw a big bird flying over the houses and the trees and the school. Off down the road, I see my cousins coming into town again and see Cecil and William walk in front of my house. I got a smile on my face and I'm happy when I have my cousin to play with. But when I get to the front porch, they just walk on by. They walk on by the soda shop. It is hot. The bird overhead is coming closer to the treetops. I go out onto the sidewalk and follow them down the street in my new shoes and across the square. Cecil goes out into the courthouse and I'm standing on the corner. People pass by, grown-ups mostly, minding their own business, and some not. All of a sudden, William comes out of the courthouse and he sees me. I could go for a soda. On the wall of the registry office, there is a notice that is strange to me, but familiar. There are some boys my age in the room, and I think they look like me, and they talk to me like I am a brother. And I don't know them, but I see me in their eyes and hair and skin. The notice reads, Land Claims On May 18th, 1905, the U.S. Court of Claims ruled in favor of the Eastern Cherokee and directed the Secretary of the Interior to identify persons entitled to a portion of the money appropriated by the U.S. Congress on June 30th, 1906, to be used for payment of these claims. Special Agent Guy Miller, Department of Interior, began his work and is appointed by the U.S. Court of Claims as a Court Special Commissioner. The Court Decree specifies that the money or land is to be distributed to all Eastern and Western Cherokees alive on May 28, 1906 who could establish that they are members of the Eastern Cherokee tribe or descendants of such members. They could not be members of any other tribe. All claims must be filed prior to August 31st, 1907. Paul has to know that the woman who dropped off my Cecil was an Indian from these parts. I feel anxious and my mouth is dry. Paul, wake up. There's something I gotta tell you. Cherokee she was. And you affirm by your signature that you are a Cherokee. Mr. Miller says to me, and I want this so bad, and in my heart and through my mouth I say, yes. Outside I hear the eagle scream. Scream! Scream! I, I'm here, I said in the air between my lips and the telephone. The sun warmed down on me through the window, and the phone was still there, wedged between my ear and my shoulder. Scree! No one on the other end. Was I talking or listening, awake or dreaming? The high-pitched scream of the phone is quieted when I place it back on the receiver and get up out of this chair, flick off the computer and turn off the screen. The sky is still clear, but the sun has moved to the other side of the apartment building, and as I look out the window, a feather falls from some bird passing overhead, calling in the cold afternoon sun. <laughs>